Okay. Um, what do I mean by the title, The Carnival of Popularity? And how exactly does it fit with the theme of our Congress? The Carnival of Popularity grew up around a single initial stimulus. It was a one and a half minute video clip from 1927 found on social media showing a pageant or carnival conducted by Shetland Islanders in a poor rural community in the far north of the British Isles. So here I want to play the clip. Okay, just start again. There isn't any sound. There was no sound in 1927. <laughs> A very quiet year. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so what made me write about and around and in response to this clip was a certain hunch or intuition that uh, here might lie some clue, maybe even some possible solution to one of the biggest cultural and political problems facing us today. That is the erosion of a once progressive and optimistic post-World War II model or ideal of an increasingly mobile, multicultural and international society. The threatened collapse of that ideal into today's increasingly divided societies. I'm talking about the corruption and diversion of democracy's promissory trajectory by the rising forces of populism. I'm talking about trying to rescue that trajectory. Thinking along these lines, it seemed to me that we might need to rest or rescue popularity, pop and the popular, in all of which artists have a stake from populism. And so we might first try to distinguish the popular from populism. We could perhaps claim with some confidence that democracy is popularity, with the rule of the people, by the people, the populace, at society's heart. Artists, meanwhile, surely have something to say about popularity, as they, we, variously, avidly, and artfully either cultivate popularity or treat it with a kind of avant-garde disdain while surreptitiously and simultaneously courting popularity, perhaps even becoming popular by making unpopular art. 
Populism, however, is not democracy. We are quite sure of that. It reminds us too much of fascism, the enemy, the nadir, the flip side or antithesis of democracy. And yet both populism and fascism, are they the same thing? Is one a prelude to the other? Clearly exploit popularity as did the German National Socialists when organizing the Degenerate Art and Great German Art exhibitions in the late 1930s, which remain, I believe, the most popular art exhibitions in the entire history of art exhibitions. However, we also know that Nazism's popularity and thus the apparent success of those exhibitions was achieved by cultivating collective fear and hatred, and by suspending and overriding democracy. In the video clip of the Shetland Islands Parade, it is crucial that everyone is masked, costumed, or both, and is thus in some way acting as other than their usual, real, or authentic self. Soldiers signed up to serve a nationalist ideology also dress up in uniform and in this way surely set aside or repress some aspects of personal identity. But one promising aspect of the Shetlands parade is that despite evoking and mimicking the militaristic attributes of a uniformed march, it is always parodic, hyperbolic, fanciful and playful, never threatening or violent. This might then suggest an extended, amplified or fanciful version of democracy in which it is no longer the people who rule, but their masks, their costumes, their play. It is a maskocracy in which costume, art, play, Mischief, difference, and misrule, rule, at least for a day. Any allegiance demonstrated here is neither to personal authenticity nor to national identity. Any allegiance in this parade is rather an allegiance to fun, art, play, and carnival. Through greater acceptance of the fluidity, uncertainty, and unknowability of identity, both personal and collective, and by detaching identity from any devotion or aspiration to authenticity, we might begin to glean, regain, or reclaim a more promissory and progressive alternative to the society in which currently, and it seems increasingly, we or people seem all too willing to identify ourselves or themselves in immutable terms. That is, as one thing and not another, as one nationality, race, gender, color, sexuality, class, age, etc., and not another. That way lies war. Meanwhile, we correspondingly identify others all too rapidly as immutably other. Today, when we talk about populism, fearing that it is a 21st century version of or entree to fascism, the we in this sentence tends, I suspect, to be a middle class perspective the perspective of people, we, who would accept that they or we could justifiably be described as such. Meanwhile, the populists that this we fears tend to be either themselves working class or maverick members of higher classes who are in some way manipulating, pandering to and reliant upon groups of working class supporters to achieve greater positions of power and influence. Thus, hopes of a peaceful conciliation 
of a middle class, working class divide, a divide that has lingered in our democracies ever since 18th, 19th and 20th century revolutions began to promise a more equal, fair and just modern world, may today seem further away, less attainable than ever. And this, despite the efforts of the noble arts to reach out across the class divide, to open their doors, provide opportunities, educate, include, regionalize, pluralize, etc. It shouldn't be forgotten that, as I stated at the very start of a previously published version of this inquiry, quote, quoting myself, I'm afraid, <laughs> professional artists and art critics might assume that art has a progressive influence on wider society. But it is difficult to deny that the evaluation of art also plays a significant role in establishing and maintaining class divides." Unquote. The image of the Shetland Islanders pageant interests me because it does not represent a potentially patronizing image of a relatively privileged but possibly misguided middle class sharing the relative abundance of its particular brand of cultural capital with those less fortunate than itself. Rather, the Shetlanders pageant seems to show a long established, we might say, classless tradition, and one that does not appear institutionalized other than on its own traditional terms. Just as it obscures or obfuscates class divides, this masked and costumed pageant, parade, or carnival also eradicates the division between art and life. Bakhtin called carnival a theater without footlights. And it provides an example of a kind of art that resides at the heart of a community. This, of course, requires a community that still has a heart. And in this clip, in this parade, perhaps we see a community that is yet to have the heart ripped out of it by the voracious 1980s, 90s and noughties globalization and financialization of previously local vernacular traditional and national economies. If we return to the political and cultural disaster that many say and that we say is facing our societies and nations today under the sign of populism, what we or I might be trying to say here is that given the models and examples above, we might begin to see that one way forward for the aforementioned we, that is, the relatively privileged and self-assured middle classes whose art and culture has resided structurally and formally at the heart of its very own modernity for over 200 years now, might be to look for ways possibly uncomfortable to begin to seed, C-E-D-E, -E, relinquish and exchange power, territory, and status with and to other cultures, but always ethically and holistically including, if and however possible, all other cultures. That is, including, given the ethical model of a holistic aspiration as per a Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example, including those we least relish embracing. Only a truly holistic politics, culture, and philosophy will ever satisfy our commonly expounded aspirations to universal peace, equality, and justice. But from where does this universal vision, this progressive aspiration, arise? 
perhaps in the ancient tradition of carnival itself? And how will it ever be delivered? Again, perhaps only through and as carnival. In its evocation of a wholesale relativism, carnival implies or suggests in temporary symbolic form at least, the possibility of a fair, just and happy society in which all, albeit costumed and masked, encounter and embrace all. To aspire to this holistic relativist vision, our we needs to seed C-E-D-E, -E, relinquish and exchange, not in a patronizing, door opening and sharing manner, but in some more substantial reciprocal demonstration of our ultimately equal status as human beings who do and must all have the same basic rights, rights which are perhaps the greatest progressive achievement of all our modernity's achievements. This might also involve a demonstrative acknowledgement of the shortcomings of the temporary settlements with which and by means of which the formative modern revolutions, themselves perhaps embodiments of carnival, of the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries concluded those great revolutions, like so many wars, ended or resolved themselves by establishing, establishing crude borders drawn between peoples, including class, economic and cultural borders that are every bit as unsatisfactory as physical land and geographic borders, and all of which seem bound to produce further subsequent anguish and conflict until the day when, again, given a holistic ideal, those borders are finally erased. Today, those modern revolutions and their legacies smolder on, their flames easily fanned by populists, their grievances inadequately assuaged by a progressive political representation. We see them carry on in stuttering, spluttering, newly complexed and confused forms evidenced by the high visibility gilets jaunes in France, but also by all the socio-political turmoil currently coming from left, right and centre almost wherever we look in the world. If we begin to conclude now by returning to the image of the Shetlands Parade. We have to assume that what is depicted there is not a modern phenomenon, but rather a pre-modern, possibly ancient tradition. And this might in turn suggest that possible solutions to today's increasingly stark class and cultural divisions may lie in the as yet underexplored archives of the early modern and pre-modern past. Their myriad ideas and images capable of making unexpected suggestions have had decades or centuries to marinade unseen and thereby develop their special ability to surprise and inquire sorry, to surprise and inspire possibilities today. Mikhail Bakhtin seemed to think as much when, writing in the Cold War climate of a nervous and stultifying Soviet Union, he embraced and promoted the model of carnival as a pre-modern alternative to achieving equality, alleviating inequality, or at least providing a pressure valve by means of which to make an apparently intrinsic and inevitable inequality more tolerable and endurable. 
In doing so, Bakhtin inadvertently, yet presciently, precociously, suggested a future society in which the division between work and play might itself become a thing of the past. Along with those divisions between the modern classes founded upon and maintained precisely by work, the nature of work, the price of work, the rewards of work, the value of work. Today, we already hear increasingly about a basic minimum wage and a post-work society. If we look one last time at the clip of 19, the 1927 Shetland Islanders, and I'll play it once more just when I finish, parading and performing in their masks and their costumes, we might then see there not the past, but some vision of a possible future. Where and when art and politics, art and life, the working and middle classes are subsumed by and into a more playful and collective life and art, a way of pursuing art, culture, life and politics in which entrenched true and authentic identities, loyalties and allegiances give way to masks, costumes, play and plays of various kinds. But the playful pageant, carnival, gala or parade are clearly also important and serious. It, and it is their art, the extent and quality of evident care, imagination, preparation, conceptualization and craft that alerts us to the fact that all of this is just as serious as it is comical. And here lies perhaps the key to the particular fascination of that, that particular image. Carnival reminds us and has always reminded us that society does not have to be the way that it is currently. That is, another world is always possible. Carnival also reminds us of contradictions and ambiguities that have the ability to expose the reasoning, the syllogisms on which current society is constructed, showing them as mutable and risable. Carnival always promises to rescue us from taking a single and simple side and thereby consolidating conflicts and division. And so it may be that Carnival and the Carnivalesque offer us hope of wresting popularity from populism, perhaps by augmenting or supplanting democracy with what we have here called a maskocracy, the rule of the mask by the mask, that slips the people and democracy out of the populist grip and awakens the people from the populist's spell. The traditional carnival documented and historicized by Bakhtin marked the end of the season of hard work. Today, communities that once found pride, identity and meaning through the annual or seasonal oscillations of work and play lost that pride, identity and meaning as 19th and 20th century capitalism morphed into late 20th and early 21st century globalization and financialization. Populists are making hay with this opportunity to capitalize on the resentments of the disenfranchised. But perhaps our promised post-work futures will finally allow us to place or replace carnival and the carnivalesque at the center of our societies and no longer, as in work societies, treated as something rare, exceptional, reserved for special days. After all, isn't the promissory pro progress that we are most proud of and most prize necessarily and always 
inevitably and inexorably leading to greater and greater rights and freedoms and ultimately to a holistic outcome in which all difference is always represented, always in play and at play, so long as it is represented in a way that is mitigated and mediated in such a way as to never be harmful to others. And I'll just play the clip again to finish. It was funnier before I spoke. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Was that a public lecture? Hello. Beg your pardon? Was it a public lecture that we were hearing? What do you Because mean? our panel is about the public and the popular. And uh, I think you see ambivalences in the world that you're playing yourself, that we are playing here, that the audience is playing, insisting somehow that we are in a silo and continuously contributing to class distinctions, actually while you're holding the other vision at the same time that we may also contribute to overcoming these distinctions. Which I think is very valuable, which I think is uh, Narzisstische Kränkung in German. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of quite hurtful the moment when more and more uh, people in the art world became aware that we play this double role mm. And are actually contributing to consolidating the status quo or make it even even worse. And it seems to me that your approach to your own practice, to your writing, your use of popular music and medium is trying somehow to negate negotiate that uncomfortable situation. Is that correct? Um, I think that um, this idea of the holistic holistic relativism <laughs> that I used there and I used in the title of a of another paper that I published in Third Text a year ago, um, which was actually quite directly about Brexit. It, Brexit was in the title, but it finished with a clause towards a holistic relativism. <laughs> um, so I suppose that concept is something that I hold dear, um, or, or, or 
and try to allow to kind of guide me or uh, undermine me or, 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 or something like that. Um, and in that respect, and I, and I think it's very challenging, but I think it is the ultimate, to me, I mean, maybe I'm naive, but it seems to me that, that maybe that's the, the ultimate challenge, this holistic relativism of the progressive project. Because, and in a way, when I was working on the final ver versions of this paper, um, it, it seems to me that, and it's something I tried to say in the paper, I don't know if it came across, but it seemed to me that, although it's a pessimistic period, and we're in kind of fear, on the back foot, as they say in English. Um, something that can seem to rally <laughs> hope um, is to remind ourselves where the, what the pro progressive project is in its biggest sense and what it has been, where did it come from, where is it leading to, what is the point of it, etc. And it seems to me that uh, yeah, this idea of holistic relativism sort of it, it reminds me of all, all, all of that. It, it, it's uh, it, it, yeah, it threatens to make everything value, valueless. <laughs> At the same time, it's the kind of ultimate goal of, of our society, is it not? Mm. For the, that we achieve universal <laughs> rights, universal freedom, universal justice, uni universal equality. Do you see what I mean? Uh, and, and just remembering that that is the project and that we have achieved some of those things. That, that we, we do live in a society which is, which is in some ways successfully progressive and we should celebrate that. And, uh, anyway, I'm wandering a bit off the point, but, but, uh, but yeah. And, and, and you are also quoting Ranciere, uh, um, who, who said that basically the, the, the left is always struggling from a quiet marginal and always staying marginal uh, uh, position in trying to expand the notion of the we in order to establish new rules of equality uh, but actually n having never, that's how I translate it, uh, uh, never providing the government. Mm. Yeah? Um, which kind of brings me to one problem I had with the concept of the carnival and the carnivalesque as you described and Bechtin describes it. Uh, it's an exception in the order of the game. It's basically a day, you said at least a day, or in some cultures uh, a longer period of time, where all hierarchies become inexistent in a playful exchange of masquerades and identities, etc. Yet it seems to me that even in Asian times, the carnival has as a precondition the struggle, the hierarchical struggle that is within a system society that is suspended for a moment where the king playfully can be decrowned and recrowned and decrowned never changes the fact mm. that the king actually keeps the crown on his head. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. So it's a kind of peacemaker. So in that respect, if we think about the carnivalesque in the 21st century from a holistic <laughs> utopia, mm. maybe, uh, uh, how, how far can we get with that concept as beautiful as it is? Well, I, I think that I, I really enjoy Bakhtin's essay, and I think I have a different reading of it to the reading yesterday. It was quite uh, strongly criticized as well. Um, but I think I just have a different reading of it. Um, I think that, um, uh, first of all, I think that, that Bakhtin, I imagine Bakhtin looking at the kind of disaster of equality that the Soviet Union was. <laughs> like like, like see, it's maybe, maybe, seeing, seeing that, maybe seeing that the attempt to, to reify uh, equality turns into uh, a kind of st uh, uh, some kind of monster or something like that. Um, but within that, looking around for all kind of other models of equality and seeing, oh, this carnival, th this is a kind of equality, even if it's for a day. Uh, it's a way of rendering, uh, of, of, of rising up the, raising up the image of, of, of equality. And, but, but as we know as artists, you know, an image, a uh, symbol, uh, can at least allow us to believe that something is possible. Uh, and, and so it's very important in that way. So that's part of my answer, just the beginning of it really. But the other thing I wanted to say is that we should think about the carnival in a much longer curve of history, I think. I started to think, well, this is, relates to what Nietzsche was interested in about Dionysus and the Bacchanalian 
there's you know th these these are obviously the roots of carnival uh, and 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 so maybe we can think of it in much longer terms that the carnival morphs I mean, Bakhtin did say this, you know, the, the carnival kind of morphs according to its different contexts, changing historical circumstances. It dissipates and breaks, sorry, it dissipates and breaks up, but little traces of it are still found here and there in odd places. You see bits of carnival, you know, for example, when we protest against Brexit, all the newspapers talk about is the clever, funny signs and costumes we wear. So, 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 um, so, 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 so I think of the carnival in that, that very long and broad way. And the last part of the answer is that, um, is that, um, is that yeah, one of those changing historical contexts is the one that I mentioned in the paper about the post-work society. Uh, and and if, the, if it's true that the carnival, I, I, think this, I think it's much broader and longer than that, as I've said, but if it's true that the carnival uh, is related to, uh, uh, I can't think of the right word now, uh, um, the peasant's lifestyle, <laughs> uh, uh, the, what's the word, servitude. Uh, if, if it's true that in, in a certain historical context it may have been abused by the Lord, by the King, <laughs> uh, to, to, to use it. it wasn't always necessarily that way. It may have been different before that time, and it could be different again. And the post-work society may... Uh, I, I even think that the, the amount of freedoms and play that we are allowed in this rich Western countries, etc., etc., is a kind of, uh, kind of a lesson in the everyday of a different kind already. I would just express a worry that I have. We're, we, we're short on time, unfortunately. Um, and there's something upon I want to ask you, but I want to express the, 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 the fear that the playgrounds uh, of the future carnival uh, could be controlled and owned by Facebook, YouTube, uh, and all these other stages uh, uh, on, on which the, the carnival might happen and therefore actually not lead to a sincere equality, because equality, you also wrote that in another piece, uh, is actually about ownership. Yeah? There's a famous quote by Benjamin, uh, who basically said that fascism is kind of uh, uh, bringing the people behind one idea without ever touching the rule of who owns what. Uh, and thus mm. oh, leave, yeah, yeah. Yeah? And uh, thus leaves the class point. divide actually in... In, in place, mm. uh, which is something that you Without could also... Without property relations. Yeah, Without which is something you could also so, uh, say about today's cultures of participation and the invitation that everybody can be part of something. Because a lot of the times it's more like a simulacrum because actually the, the containers in which this con participation happens are owned and controlled by some people or by uh, a museum as an institution for that matter. Mm. But I want to speak about something that we need to bring into the discussion, because you're, you're an author. You say you're not a, you're not a c art critique, but you write very precise, sincere reviews. Uh, and talking about critique, uh, there's something I want to mm, clear out somehow. Criteria, uh, um, critique for me is mainly the making of criteria. Criteria of judgment, criteria of what is important to describe and, uh, and what not. And it seems to me, since criteria are not given to us, mm. we have to make uh, certain choices what are actually helpful and valuable criteria. And here, with regard to, to the notion of the public and the notion of the popular, I feel a certain tension or dilemma between them. Because it seems to me that the public is something that rather appears, arises from struggle, from conflict, from the need to debate. It, it's not just there because people love each other and, and share a broader conversation. Uh, often there's a reason to have this broader conversation. Uh, whereas the popular may be based more on criteria of understandable for many, likable for many, maybe not so conflictuous, like how conflictuous is Madonna, yet she's very popular. Um, the moment when Michael Jackson has a problem, suddenly we have public debate. Mm. So I just want to say those are not, I don't think they're exactly the same thing. So do you tend to contribute to the, the a public sphere as a conflictuous kind of conversation to have? 
also as a writer? Or are you tending to create, say, agreement, understanding among people? This is a personal question, isn't it? Well, you're also a pop musician, you're a critical intellectual, so I also want to address your public, your, your, your practice. Well, I didn't expect to be asked such a personal question, <laughs> but um, I can only say that, um, I, yeah, I suppose, well, I, what, what I will say about it is that, um, yeah, my career, if I, if I can call it that, uh, immodestly, um, has sort of fluctuated between uh, fine art and pop music and, and back again and 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 for most of my uh, younger life I um, found that very difficult quite painful uh, this kind of conflict of crashing between two what seemed to me two quite distinct cultures even though they seem so porous and so liberal and so free uh, in actual fact you, you do come across, you do come up against cultures, silos, borders, edges. And um, all I can say is that I've strived uh, and I continue to strive to eradicate those borders either outside myself but also inside myself uh, because I'm not sure whether they lie outside or inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's exciting. When I make progress with it, it feels very exciting that you are actually kind of so, so when I start writing about popular music, it's one way I've been trying to do that. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but ways of doing it. But um, yeah, I don't know if it's answering your question, but but uh, no, it is because I think it's very valuable and very important to not, like not not hide or suppress these inner conflicts or this inner negotiation that 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 you have between these different kind of fears of a, like political ambition. Yeah, maybe, I think it's relevant to and, the paper. That, and then a more abstract utopia. Yeah, that that you also embody. Yeah, it's un it's kind of uncompromising, in my mm -hmm. own modest way. It's kind of uncompromising. Mm -hmm. I sort of refuse the borders. <laughs> I have one last nasty question, and then we have to open up to A nasty question. Okay. Nasty question. It's not nasty towards you, but towards the idea of carnival. What if populism was actually the carnival of our time? Mm. Well, this came up yesterday. Because it's anti-elite, it's disrupted, it's decrowning and recrowning, it turns moral orders upside down, it implies the opposite of what is actually said, it presents itself as the exception from what is, the, what is established. Those are all the criteria coming from Bacton. Mm. All of those apply wonderfully to populism. Yeah, it came up yesterday and uh, it kind of scared me. But uh, 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 because I hadn't really thought, of, thought about the outright uh, carnival, I hadn't thought of it, and it was quite a shocking uh, uh, idea to me. Although I had considered, of course, that, that many of our elected uh, uh, presidents and prime ministers, etc., in the last few years have been bombastic clowns. Uh, in fact, it started to be, I mean, Nigel Farage reads like a clown, Boris Johnson reads like a clown. Um, Beppo Grillo reads like is a, and we and the Ukrainian president is a comedian, no? Is he? Is that right? So 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 we do have a kind we, of age. We of, start to have more and more of those. Yeah, so we do have a kind of age of clowns, which was always on my agenda. I was always interested in that. that there's a kind of a less happening some somehow in that peculiar way, which is fa I mean it's fascinating as well as terrifying. It's, you know, it seems frightening and terrifying, but these things are also from our point of view as cultural theorists. I suppose it's absolutely fascinating. And all I can say about it is that um, I rewrote some of my paper last night uh, after hearing about the uh, conservative uh, version of the carnival uh, and thinking about it a bit more. Um, but also that um, what I tried to say in the paper and probably which is the most difficult part to say in the paper is that, is that if we truly believe that the progressive project leads to some kind of ultimate goal, a kind of this universalism that I've talked about, um, then somehow we do have to exchange and seed and, uh, and incorporate and discuss with everyone, <laughs> is what I'm saying, you know, everyone has to be at play, in play, uh, in this universal progressive vision. Which is a kind of seems like a paradox, but but every, obviously everyone has to be there, otherwise it's war. <laughs> and I, I was trying to avoid war. 
which is actually something that's very dear to me also in my own practice, and that's the, the last thing maybe to trigger some of you also. Uh, you, um, you quoted, I think it was also Rancière, by saying that people, like what, what I call the normal people, yeah, have competence, have experience, have responsibility, like they have criteria, yeah? have discourse, have resources, all of which rarely ever are considered in the art world as being like trustworthy or, or, or valuable or, or really coming in, into the conversation other than something that's being talked about. But you wrote that there's actually no gaze back or no speaking back from if we stay in class metaphors from the working class. And I think with regard to critics and intellectuals uh, who have a usually a different setup of resources, competences, uh, uh, and social standards. This is maybe a, a, a political challenge to, to integrate into the future making of criteria. It's, and now, let's open up the floor. Uh, I might need translation. That was the first one, right here. Are we running over? Uh, my name is Liam. I and me. Uh, I spoke earlier today, so I told you that I was a critic. But Paul, I wanted to say to you um, that I recall seeing this clip at a civil rights gathering in Belfast in the late 60s. And we were told at the time that these people were on a civil rights march and that they were demanding separation from the rest of Scotland and that they chose Carnival because they wanted to resist vegetarians and vegan coming into the islands and being corrupted by sophisticated habits in Aberdeen and Dundee. Yeah. That's a different reading. Let's <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> Let's actually collect questions because we only have 10 minutes left. There were two hands over there in the back. Yeah. Yes? Yep. Yeah? Uh, okay, so um, <coughs> thank you. I just wanted to. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Ruben Fawkes, London, uh, UCL, and Translocal Institute. And uh, uh, so, what, one thing in the film, what was very striking in that film, one of the most striking costumes was the, the walruses. And I was just thinking about this thing about how. Carnival is breaking down barriers between different societies and different social identities. But also, uh, it came to my mind also that it's also about, may, might be about going beyond the, the human. So the, the fact that the, it's interesting that at that moment that people are actually, uh, t you know, putting so much effort in and posing by the sea as walruses. And you see this whole crowd of uh, walruses by the sea and you can't help thinking, well, today you wouldn't see that because of climate change and uh, the sixth extinction and so on, you'd be much less likely to see. And it just made me think that, uh, uh, you know, w when you said that this has been destroyed in a way by, uh, you know, th three decades of globalization, is perhaps what we're talking about, not so much globalization, but, uh, you know, the rise of uh, an extractivist model of industrial Capitalism and the great extinction, uh, great, sorry, great acceleration, which really starts in the 1930s. So it's, it's funny. There's also that aspect of uh, uh, of, of the carnival that might reveal this tension too. Sorry. Can I? So let, yeah. let's take one more. The lady right behind the can camera. I just, can I just quickly answer that? Just just very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Just just to, just to say that 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 it makes me think of the the most universal of rights that we are pursuing aren't just of all human beings, but of animals and the planet itself, which is on our agenda now every day, uh, if you see what I mean. So, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, it's my turn. Okay. Linda Grace Gardner, art critic from Hamburg and curator in all kinds of other functions. I was thinking, of course, of Jeremy Deller's uh, approach, um, how he has actually uh, imported uh, uh, popular culture into the world of arts, uh, which in a very powerful way, I think. It was one of my absolute favorite exhibitions when he first showed his archives. Um, and I think what you were, or my idea of what you were transporting is actually the anarchic spirit of the carnivalesque, which is maybe much more prevalent also in popular culture 
and thus maybe not so easily usurped by populism, possibly. Yeah, I just wanted to say that one of my favorite artworks I've ever seen is this video that Jeremy Deller and Alan Kane compiled of all the going around Britain and Scotland and all these tiny villages finding their exactly. strange rituals and rites and videos. That's, that's it's absolutely to astounding me. to watch. I mean, and I suppose I, I love that kind of thing because it, because it steps outside of the usual institution of, of art, etc. Um, but just to say the other, the other part of your, the, the word anarchic um, I just I, I, I'm not sure where that sits in it to me because because the carnival is always is always disruptive by nature, mm -hmm. but it, uh, isn't it always anarchic? Well, what I, what I meant to say is that it's not controllable so easily, you uh, know. By yeah, hopefully, yeah, hopefully these things are so deep rooted and 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 strange and and and, and the people themselves can be loyal and then disloyal. <laughs> uh, so hopefully we're seeing that sort of temporary. Uh, something that the, the, the more ancient uh, tradition of carnival can refuse and, and transcend, I think. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. yeah. Thank you. The next I have on my list is the lady in the back, if she's still up to. Um, hello, my name is Sasha Craddock, and I'm a critic and curator from London. Um, I just want to mention another thing, which is that we do have carnival, and many, many countries have carnival. And there is a carnival in London, which is called the Notting Hill Carnival, which is apparently the biggest street party in Europe. The reason I'm mentioning that, which seems very literal, is that in a way, strangely, Paul, you're surprised by these other things that happen. Um, for instance, the outright having carnival-esque. The fact that colonies and, and, and other whole parts of the world actually have carnival that's massively important is important. I'm not saying that for very liberal reasons, but in a way to talk about the fact that all this thing and the idea that another world is possible or the fact that that is, is always absorbed very quickly and controlled. And a little aside, the Notting Hill Carnival is so enormous and so successful and apparently such great fun, I don't know why I don't go every bloody year, that actually BBC television is now discussing dropping the very middle class Glastonbury and actually sending television to record and to be in the streets in London for the time where the black, a lot of people, mainly in London, young black people, it's the only time anybody can go out in the street and really, really have a good time. This sounds a bit literal, but it's actually very political and about a notion of consciousness, of the possibility, but also the absorption of any kind of difference or enjoyment and pleasure that actually was mentioned at the very beginning. Mm. Yeah. Try the next one will be here in front. We, ha we were given five more minutes. I would like to ask you for short questions and short answers, and I'm warning you, the next panel will start without a break immediately <laughs> afterwards. Okay, just a very short um, response to those two things. Firstly, the expert on globalized carnival is Claire Tanson, the contemporary of Jeremy Della. Secondly, when you're talking about the future society without work, the actual problem of workers' so-called leisure, les loisirs de l'ouvrier, were discussed as early as 1895 in the context of the Second International uh, because of industrialization. And you can't really, uh, you know, the problem of what they might get up to and how subversive they might be, uh, even in their very little spare time, when there were arguments even for a 35 or 40 hour week. So I just wanted to say that from um, administrative and policing and what the hell are we going to do with these human cogs in the wheel when they're not actually in the machinery has been something people have been thinking about since the 19th century. Yeah, thanks, I'll follow up with those references. Who's next? Anybody else? These two. Thank you very much. Um, you helped me to understand. My name is Susanna Sully from France, art critic. And uh, you helped me to understand a big phenomenon. But uh, when we were looking the, the film, I think it speaks about Viking Carnival on the Viking. film, oh, yeah, yeah. so it means that it was something that came from far away, 
And uh, I remember the rituals of the ancient people, and it was related to sun festival, religious, and it was once a year at the beginning of some kind of spring. Hmm? And uh, this was then um, superposed to some occidental rituals in religion, and then it was superposed to the end of the year and to the um, how you say, um, party of the happy days of the end of the year. Mm. And uh, what about Brazil Carnival? I remember uh, the Brazilian Carnival was not for the working class people, it was more for the lower class, mm. so people out of class, popular event, and it was showing what it was hiding in the society, and it was so, it was not so rich carnival, the people work one year to have the costumes. Mm. And I agree, and that was very interesting, to think that now we are in a global carnival, what it means, a lot of carnivals everywhere, and what it means, it was poor, now it becomes Mm. like brilliant pirates of a new and brilliant society. And I think that it was very interesting mm. to see that artists like Elio Itisica, they were using this as a revolutionary aspect of art, mm. participation, and the whole question what it should be, is what means to be revolutionary in art. Mm. Thank you very much. Sorry. No, thank you. So unfortunately, we have to come to an end. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank and you. I, I really recommend to, to read his texts. I had a great pleasure discovering them. Thank you very much.